Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at igneous rocks. So this video is going to correspond to section 5.6 of your textbook. So we've discussed the processes through which we can cause a rock to melt. So now we need to think about the processes that are involved in the formation of igneous rocks. So you can see here we have a section through the earth. Now we are going to generate our magma down here through the process of melting. Now we've discussed that melting can occur due to heating, so thermal melting. It can occur due to decreasing pressure, which is decompression melting, or it can occur through the addition of water, which is going to be hydration or flux melting. So there's three ways we can cause a rock to melt. Now where this melting occurs ranges in depth. Melting can occur anywhere between typically about 40 and 150 kilometers in depth. That's typically the range in which rocks will melt. Now, when a rock is melting, it is actually very, very rare that you will be able to melt the entire rock. So typically you will only melt a portion of that rock. And so this process of only melting a bit of a rock is referred to as partial melting. So most magmas are the result of partial melting versus full melting. Full melting is relatively uncommon. Now, once we've actually formed our magma, it's going to want to rise because magma is less dense than the surrounding rock. It's more buoyant, so it's going to want to go upwards. And that's exactly what our magma will do. It will start to head upwards. So our magma will initially begin to accumulate into a rising body. So this magma is going to steadily start moving its way through the crust. And as it's making its way through the crust, it's going to occasionally stop and it's going to become part of a magma chamber. So a magma chamber essentially is just a body of magma under the surface. And magma chambers will often form in response to some kind of blockage. So there's something in the way that stops the magma rising efficiently. And so let's just say it's a layer of rock that the magma can't get through easily. And so the magma rises, it hits this layer of rock, and it can't get through it. So the magma begins to pool behind this obstruction. Now, eventually, the magma can do one of three things. It can either just stay there forever, solidify, and form a solid rock. Or it can burn its way through the obstacle, and sometimes, if the magma is hot enough, it will slowly be able to melt its way through whatever the obstacle is, and then continue on its journey. The other option is that it can simply go around the obstacle. It can find a path which allows it to get around the obstacle and once again continue its journey up. But this process of making magma accumulate ends up forming these bodies in the subsurface which we refer to as magma chambers. Now, the vast majority of magma chambers will actually be situated at relatively shallow depths, and some magma chambers will uh, allow magma to continue towards the surface, where that magma will be erupted onto the surface to produce volcanoes. And as we know, volcanoes can produce a mixture of both lava flows and ash if the volcanic eruption is explosive. Now, we've discussed that if a magma cools slowly underground, it's going to produce rocks, with igneous rocks which have large crystals, and we will classify these igneous rocks as plutonic. And so plutonic rocks will be forming in the subsurface, typically within these magma chambers. In terms of the volcanic igneous rocks, we've discussed that they will form through the rapid cooling of a lava, and so we're going to obviously see volcanic igneous rocks forming at the surface, and just below the surface as well. So when your magma is in this region up here, the temperature is going to be dropping very, very quickly, and so, it's the, so the rock is going to start solidifying very, very quickly in that region as well. So not all volcanic rocks form on the surface of the Earth. The vast majority of them do, but some volcanic rocks can actually form in the subsurface, so beneath the surface. So now we need to think about the role of the source area in forming our magma. So you can see in this diagram we have two different areas of rock which are being melted to form magma. On the left we have the melting of a mantle rock. On the right we have the melting of continental crust. So how is this going to affect the magma which we have? Okay, the melting of mantle rocks can lead to the formation of mafic and 
ultramafic magmas. So you're thinking, hold on a second, how can I melt the same material and yet produce two different magmas? Well, it all comes back to this partial or full melting. So mantle rocks, as we know, are dominated by iron, magnesium silicate minerals, and lesser amounts of calcium silicate minerals. Now the thing is, is that the calcium silicate minerals have the lowest melting point of those three. So iron and magnesium silicate minerals will often have quite a high melting point. The melting point for calcium silicate minerals is lower. So when I start to cause my mantle rock to melt, which minerals are going to melt first? The answer is the calcium silicate minerals. And so this means if I partially melt the mantle rock, I'm going to simply melt the phases, the minerals which are most easily melted, which are going to be the calcium silicate minerals. And so what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a magma that contains lots of calcium and lesser amounts of iron and magnesium. This is going to be my mafic magma. In contrast, if I melt all or at least a very large proportion of the mantle rock, I'm going to get a magma which reflects the composition of the original rock. So I'm going to get a magma that's very, very rich in iron and magnesium because I've managed to melt not only the lower temperature calcium silicate minerals, but also the higher temperature iron and magnesium minerals. And mantle rocks contain lots of iron and magnesium minerals. And so when I start melting those, I produce a magma that's very, very rich in iron and magnesium. And so you'll see, depending on whether we partially or fully melt our source rock, it's going to affect the composition of the magma we get. So then let's start thinking about what happens if we melt continental crust. Now, the melting of continental crust can give us felsic or intermediate magmas. And once again, it's a question of what's melting and also to some degree a little bit of mixing. So in the case of continental crust, we know it's dominated by granites. So how do we actually end up melting the continental crust? Well, as the magma that has formed down here in the mantle starts to rise, it hits the bottom of the continental crust. Now, the thing about the continental crust is it has a melting point which is relatively low. So it's going to be somewhere in the region of 700 to 1,000, sorry, 750 to 1,000 degrees Celsius. And it just so happens that the magmas that we're creating down here are going to have a temperature uh, somewhere in the region of 1,400 to 1,200 degrees Celsius. So you're going to have very, very hot magma in contact with rock, which has a relatively low melting point. And so obviously the presence of this very hot magma here is going to cause the continental crust to begin melting. Now, if I fully melt the continental crust, that's going to give us a magma which represents the you know, the composition of the continental crust. And so we know the continental crust is dominated by rocks like granite, rocks which are very, very rich in silicon, aluminium, sodium, and potassium. And so if we fully melt the continental crust, we are going to produce a magma, which is going to be rich in silicon, aluminium, sodium, and potassium. So felsic magmas are the result of complete or near complete melting of the continental crust. Now, intermediate magmas are a little bit more complicated. So intermediate magmas are the result of mixing between magma produced by the melting of the continental crust plus the addition of some of the magma produced by melting rocks from the mantle. And so this is how you end up with this rather complicated uh, chemical makeup for intermediate magma. So intermediate magmas will contain silicon, aluminium, sodium, and potassium, which comes from the melting of the continental crust, but they will also contain a reasonable amount of calcium and lesser amounts of iron and magnesium, which comes from the magma produced from the melting of mantle rocks. And so intermediate magmas are a little bit more complicated in how they form. But you can see that in the case of mantle rocks, when you melt a mantle rock, you're going to get a mafic or ultramafic magma. When you melt continental crust, you're going to get either a felsic or an intermediate magma. So the source area is all important when controlling the chemical composition of the magma that you are forming. 
So next we need to think, are there any other factors which will affect the composition of our magma or the composition of the rocks that form from that magma as it cools down? So now let's begin to think about what happens when our magma goes and crystallizes. So in this instance, you can see we have ourselves a magma chamber. So we're in the subsurface, we're underground. And so this means our magma is going to cool down slowly. And this means our magma is therefore going to have uh, nice big crystals forming. So as we begin to form our crystals, what can happen? Well, there's a couple of things that could possibly occur. Either the crystals that we form are going to be denser than the magma they're held in, in which case they're going to sink, or the crystals which form are going to be less dense than the magma in which they form, in which case they're going to float. And so as we can see in this particular model here, we can see we have these brown crystals which are clearly denser than the magma that they're forming from. And so they will naturally sink towards the bottom of the magma chamber. And most of the time, the minerals which are denser than the surrounding magma will very often be ferromagnesium minerals, so minerals rich in iron and magnesium. They often tend to be denser than the magma in which they form from, and so they'll sink. In contrast, felsic crystals, so these tend to be minerals which are more rich in sodium, potassium, and to some degree calcium, will tend to have a density which is lower than the magma from which they form, and so they will naturally float. And so you can begin to see that we can actually end up forming distinct regions as our magma chamber slowly crystallizes, with the mafic denser minerals forming a layer at the bottom, and the lighter, more felsic minerals forming a layer at the top. And so we can end up forming these what are referred to as stratified intrusions, where we have distinct you know, it's distinctly different uh, mineral layers within our intrusion. So we can see an example of this here. So here we have an example of a type of rock called a magnetotite, and this one is from South Africa. So magnetotites, as you can see, consist of two minerals in this case. We have this dark gray mineral, which is the iron oxide mineral magnetite. It's a very dense mineral. It's a very heavy mineral. And so when magnetite formed from the magma, its density is greater than that of the magma. And so it sinks to the bottom of the magma chamber and it forms a layer which is very, very rich in magnetite. In contrast, when the uh, calcium plagioclase feldspar went and formed, which is the white mineral you can see here, well, that's less dense in the magma, so that naturally wants to float. And so that starts to move towards the top of the magma chamber, resulting in a higher abundance of plagioclase feldspar towards the top. And as you can see, as you progress down, the abundance of pl calcium plagioclase feldspar decreases and the amount of magnetite increases. And if we head the other way, the amount of magnetite gets lower and the amount of calcium feldspar increases. Sorry, that should be calcium plagioclase feldspar increases. So you can see that this process of crystal settling can lead to stratified intrusions. So another process that can take place uh, within the subsurface is something which is referred to as magma mixing. So in the case of magma mixing, we have two different magmas. We have this magma over here, which is orange, and this magma over here, which is yellow. Now, they would form initially in different magma chambers, but we can see that over time, the wall that separates these two magma chambers has slowly been degraded, and eventually it breaks down, allowing one magma to mix with the other. So this process of magma mixing will produce a magma here, which is a hybrid between the two magmas. So we have magma A, which is red, and magma B, which is yellow. And here, where the two are mixing, we'll end up with a new magma, which is called magma C. Now, that will occur if the two magmas are miscible. And miscible means that they can mix into each other. So that would be like taking water and coke. You can take those two liquids, mix them together, and you'll form a water-coke hybrid mixture. Now, there's also another situation, though, where the magmas are immiscible. They will not mix together. And think of that like oil and water. You have these two liquids and they will not mix into each other. And so this is actually what you can see in this image here. So you can see we have uh, two rocks, uh, two magmas, sorry, which are trying to mix together. 
Now you'll notice though, they haven't successfully mixed. You can see that the margins of these bodies are highly irregular. There's lots and lots of topography there. That's telling us that these two uh, liquids were, well, these two materials were liquid when they started mixing. However, we can see this mixing was unsuccessful. And so this is a clear indication that these two magmas were immiscible with each other. They would not mix into one another. And so they, you know, they remained separate phases. One phase is marked out by this darker, more mafic rock here. And the other phase is marked out by this more medium gray intermediate magma here or intermediate rock here. And so magma mixing can result in the formation of a new hybrid magma, or it can result in an immiscible situation where we end up with two magmas which refuse to mix with each other. Now, another way which we can change our magma during its path through the crust is through the process of assimilation. Now, in the case of assimilation, what happens is, is the magma begins to incorporate pieces of the host rock. The host rock is the rock that the magma is moving through. And so your magma begins to incorporate pieces of the host rock in the magma. Now, a lot of the time your magma is going to be very, very hot. The host rock will typically be quite cool. And so the pieces of host rock that fall into the magma will melt. And this means that they will then become part of the magma. And this will actually allow the magma's composition to change over time. So here we have a situation where we can see we have a lighter colored, where probably maybe felsic or intermediate uh, magma mixing with what appears to be a darker colored rock here. So this darker colored rock is probably some kind of metamorphic rock. And when we look at it, especially along these margins here, we can see once again, we have quite irregular and also quite diffuse margins. You can see the, the edges aren't nice and sharp. Compare that over here where we have these nice, clear, clean edges there. Compare that to an area like here where you can see the margins are more diffuse. It's a bit more fuzzy. And so this is telling us that this darker colored metamorphic rock is melting and is being incorporated into this lighter colored rock here, which was once a, a liquid magma. And so this means that in these areas where the country rock, the host rock is melting, it means it's going to change the composition of our magma over time. And so as our magma moves through the crust, it is going to change in its chemical composition if it undergoes the process of magma mixing or assimilation. So it's not always a simple journey from our magma forming down deep in the crust to the surface. Sometimes along the way, it can change its composition. And obviously that's going to have an effect on the types of minerals which will crystallize out from that magma when it eventually cools down enough. Okay, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.